I think you'll really enjoy this discussion with author Dave Butler. I have the opportunity to sit down with people like Dave and discuss these things, people that have really spent years and years delving into the scriptures. If you want an opportunity to do a little bit more of a deep dive into the scriptures, you should check out Quick Study Group. You can go to quickmedia.com, that's cwicmedia.com, and up at the top of the menu, you can find the Quick Study Group. This is a global study study group. We do a new study session every week. We follow the Come Follow Me curriculum, and there's a portal there where you're able to access all of the study sessions that we've done. Quick Study Group, found at quickmedia.com. Here we go. All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. On this episode, we've brought in Dave Butler, the author of Plain and Precious Things. Dave, welcome to the show. Greg, thanks for having me. I am very excited about this. Uh, well, it's been now a few months. We, we sat down in a little Mexican restaurant and had, I don't know, a two or three or four hour lunch and, uh, and talked about these things. This stuff is just like, it's enriching. It is, uh, it's like a feast when you go through this. So I'm very excited about this. I want to cover primarily the setting of the Book of Mormon. Um, as you call them, the visionary man, we'll get into that. Yeah. I want to go into, if we get to all of this, the sermon, the Isaiah three to six, and then we'll go into the Sermon on the Mount. But let's start off with the environment in Jerusalem at the time of Lehi. You know, a lot of people don't really consider this. It's, they just kind of go into the Book of Mormon and, and, start from there and but yet what's happening there is nephi and lehi are reacting to what is happening in jerusalem which is a complete revolution of the theology and theocracy there in jerusalem can you kind of just at a higher level start talking about what is happening in jerusalem at the time of lehi yeah so uh this is a great question greg um, I've been thinking over the last couple of days, looking forward to this conversation and trying to think about different ways to approach the subject um, uh, th than maybe we have before. And, and one of the uh, ideas that occurred to me was that there's a series of questions that, uh, that we don't ask about the Book of Mormon that actually it's a little bit surprising that we don't ask. Now, and I think they all... Uh, I think they all, I'm going to get, I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer your question. It's going to feel like a long answer, but I'm going to get You're there. You're good. Okay. So um, in, in writing, I wrote back 12 years ago now, uh, two books on the, on the Book of Mormon and, and sort of what I think, uh, what seems to me to be an important key for understanding. And again, it's very much on the, on the question you're asking me. And, um, the, I wrote. I wrote then that for me, one of the uh, keys that kind of opened the door to thinking about the Book of Mormon this way was the work of Margaret Barker. Now, Margaret is a Methodist scholar, and and she's a, she's a bomb thrower in all the best ways, and uh, and and her work in an important way all seeks to answer one question, which is. Uh, what is the mental world of the people who accept Jesus when he shows up, right? If we, if we look at the Gospels and say, let's try and extract a secular history out of this, well, there, along comes this fellow Jesus, and, and we know who he is. There is his mother. There are his brothers. We know their names. They're all real people, right? They grew up among us, and yet somehow large numbers of people from very early on are willing to say about this guy, Jesus is Lord, meaning Jesus is Yahweh. This fellow, right, the son of a tectone, which is not a fine arts carpenter. It's like a, it's a guy who knocks up drywall and timbers, okay? This guy who's the son of, a, of Joseph, he's our national, he's our God, right? What must those people, what mental furniture must they have had to answer to be able to do that? And she's written them. A dozen books, maybe. Um, and uh, for me, the question is, oh, that's interesting. So what must the mental world of Nephi be for him to write the things that he does? Right. 
we we know uh, as, as a parenthetical, it's easy to think and talk about the Book of Mormon as if it's something like the transcript of a CCTV camera. Obviously, it's not, right? The small plates of Nephi are a, the, a work of art. They're a work of maybe even poetry, but but they're a work of literature written by Nephi and by his successors, right? And uh, and what what must they have, you know, uh, what are they thinking that makes all this make sense? And I think um, an important, uh, in broad pictures, okay, broad, broad strokes, um, during Lehi's lifetime, we had uh, on the throne of the kingdom of Judah, the second of the famous uh, reformer kings uh, of the kingdom, okay, Josiah. And uh, the, the Hezekiah had preceded him by about a century. Hezekiah is kind of second half of the 8th century, meaning 700-ish, 720 something, I forget the exact dates, BC. Uh, and, and Josiah is 100 years later. So uh, before Nephi is born or when he's very, very young, uh, we have the reign of, Hezekiah, of Josiah, who, um, who the Old Testament describes as a reformer, meaning the, I should, I should be more, more clear, uh, the historical books of the Old Testament. So uh, Second Kings, okay, and Chronicles following Second Kings describes uh, Josiah as a reformer, meaning it says about him, oh, we had gone astray, we were, we were apostate, uh, and Josiah came and, and got us back on track. Now, um, there's a lot of interesting uh, things to say. And I, I am, I'm a writer, right? I'm a novelist. Um, I, I don't teach for a living. So, uh, but, but there's, there's a, meaning you're not going to find me in the faculty of a, the, a divinity school or anything, right? Go, don't go look for me in the BYU religion CES department. CES program. Yeah, I am, I am not a CES instructor. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, I am not the Dave Butler who has a Mormon spirituality blog. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I'm going to give a, a high level summary, right? So, uh, one, it seems like the reforms of Josiah are connected ideologically to the book of Deuteronomy, meaning he seems to be the enforcing arm that goes around and puts the ideas of Deuteronomy into. Uh, into effect. And and maybe, right, comments, I'm reading a commentary in the book of Isaiah, Jim Roberts' commentary in the book of Isaiah right now, and uh, and he, he suggests that actually maybe those ideas came from the northern kingdom and they came as early as the time of Hezekiah, and the same ideas were what was the same sort yeah. of political religious movement was driving Hezekiah a century earlier. Okay, I so think that's right. I've studied that quite a bit. It's uh, it, they came from. It looks to me like they came from the north, yeah. And, and it, it, it may have been at the time, you know, seven twenty one BC. Maybe they got exiled. They came down yeah. uh, at that time. But there's there's strong the evidence that they are. Trouble. Yeah, yeah. And 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 there's a lot of ideological similarity between kind of Hezekiah, Josiah, Book of Deuteronomy. One one thing it wants to do is it wants to centralize everything in Jerusalem. Another thing it, is it wants to do is it, it wants to depersonalize God, right? So even though the book of Exodus, Exodus 24, describes the elders of Israel going up onto a mountain, this is a subject, if we talk long enough today, we may come back to this, but it's an, an ascent through three-part space where the elders of Israel, Moses and Joshua, ascend from part one, foot of the mountain, to part two, where they have a feast with the Lord. And, and he's clearly human, Right, he has feet, okay, and and there's a table, and they have a feast with him. And then, by the way, uh, only Moses and Joshua ascend to the third part, which is uh, they ascend through a cloud to the top of the mountain. Um, now, by the way, this sort of gets us down the the road we want to get to. Ultimately, an ascent through three part space is a description of an ascent through temple space, okay, which. Uh, I'm a little ahead of us, uh, is what we have in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it is what we have in First Nephi 8. It even connects what we have in Jacob 5. Um, so, so we have this reform. Okay. Oh, so sorry. Exodus says you, 
you know, the elders of Israel saw God. Deuteronomy says you did not. You did flat out says it denies it. You did not see God. People, you have to read all the scriptures to appreciate that um, the scriptures contain multiple voices disagreeing with each other, right? Sometimes on banal stuff like which apostle ran the foot race to the garden? Well, it depends on which gospel you read. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes on sort of moral stuff like, hey, do Christians need to be circumcised? And there's a fight between James and Paul, and that's in the New Testament. And Paul's a jerk about it. Paul says in Galatians, he hopes that James and his men accidentally castrate themselves while they're doing the whole circumcision thing, the, the the liars, right? So, um, but 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 predating all of that, we have this massive conflict, but apparently between the re reformers, uh, who are in fact introducing a new religion before the disputes between Paul and James, uh, before the question of which apostle made it to the tomb, we have this this colossal fight between. Um, what appears, if you read, uh, this is a fundamental idea in modern scholarship about the Bible, okay, that there were, uh, A, that there are multiple voices speaking, different ideologies, different beliefs recorded in the Bible, um, but also B, that the last one, or one of the last ones, the one that kind of edited everything together and then kind of got in the last word, was was the Deuteronomy people, and they're not the original religion of Israel. As you say, maybe they came down from the north. They might even have been uh, seen as foreigners. And, and, uh, and so they, they, they rewrite the history. You didn't, get, you didn't see Moses. They changed the way priesthood is exercised. You can't do your local sacrifices anymore. You've got to come into Jerusalem. Right. They uh, they they subtly rewrite the, the well, they murder thousands of priests that are out in the high places. <laughs> yes. And to try and cleanse, to cleanse the land and the and the uh, the the religion. That's exactly right. So and if you go read this is what I describe Josiah as being sort of an enforcer. He's the strong man. OK, you go read Second Kings. Uh, what is it? Twenty one, twenty two. I find it very hard to like him. Because although the book says he is, you know, heroic and noble and the greatest, he's killing people is what he's doing. Um, and, and the King James translators don't help. There's some real dishonesty. This William Deaver, um, who was uh, actually I'm not sure he's still alive. If he's alive, he's quite elderly now. He's, re he's retired biblical archaeologist. And um, he wrote uh, he, he writes books with provocative titles like Did God Have a Wife? Um, which is a great book, uh, but he, he calls this uh, a historical slander, okay, the King James translation. When, when you go through uh, First Kings, and I'm not looking at it, but 21 and 22, I think is my recollection, uh, Josiah is described as uh, punishing going after the Sodomites, okay? The problem is that the underlying Hebrew text has nothing in it about Sodomites at all. What it says is the, the Kodeshim, the holy ones. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the same translation, uh, the King James translation, when Yahweh appears with his Kodeshim in, what is it, Deuteronomy 32, uh, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, it translates Kodeshim as the saints. But here where Josiah, who, you know, the Protestant translators, the King James probably identify with, right? And he's going to come clean out the abuses. Where Josiah is smashing their houses and driving them out, the King James translators decide, well, what are holy ones? Well, probably sacred male prostitutes. But as William Deaver says, there's actually no reason to think that. It's slander. Right. So there's somebody called the holy ones, which in other contexts is saints or angels. Maybe it's priests. Josiah is driving them out. He's destroying somebody called the Kemarim. Now, uh, there are uh, two two words uh, for priest in uh, Old Testament Hebrew. OK, this is the, the Kohanim, the Kohen. OK, uh, well, actually, there's multiple words. The Kohanim is one. Uh, Kemarim is another. Now, we don't know who the Kemarim were, okay? Um, but, but just by, by way of like possibilities, 
uh, in the Syriac Old Testament. So Syriac is a language related to Hebrew. Uh, it got a very early translation of the Bible. So when scholars are looking at Hebrew and it's hard to understand the biblical Hebrew and they're trying to take their best guess what was really meant here, they'll look first at the Greek, which is sort of the oldest alternate version, and arguably the second most useful witness to what did the Hebrew really mean is the Syriac, because it's also old. And, and sometimes people think, okay, the, the reading that the Syriac has is probably originally uh, what the Hebrew said, okay? And after the Syriac, they'll look at like later the Targums or Latin Vulgate or whatever, right? But, but the Syriac Bible, the Peshitta is the name of it, okay? When it talks, the, 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 the word Kumra, sorry, the word Kamar in biblical Hebrew is, is Kumra in the Syriac language of the Peshitta. And when Melchizedek appears to uh, Abraham in the book of Genesis, he is described as a Qumran. Okay? So we don't know who the Kamarim are, but like there's this interesting note that maybe they're connected with Melchizedek. But uh, Josiah goes after them, and the King James translation calls them idolatrous priests. And again, this is just slander. There's no reason to think they were idolatrous. There was some class of priests in Israel, maybe associated with Melchizedek. That's super interesting. Josiah goes after them, and he smashes stuff up. And he, he uh, both of these guys also um, massively, uh, uh, well, they're famous for, and they, they, they're glorified for destroying something called the Asherah, about which there are all kinds of really big, interesting questions, which we may get to today, right? So this is, this is Lehi's, probably Nephi is born after this, or on the tail end of this, right? This is, this is the big reform, i.e. the violent, bloody, political, uh, coercive reorganizing of Israel's religion that happens during Lehi's time. Now, it's super interesting, right, that Nephi's party seems not seems to identify themselves um, by, by a term. So the, the boys get back from Jerusalem after a, after a little bit of uh, try and try again, and we've got the records, okay? And it turns out Sariah has been unhappy. And and she says, and she's was she she had complained about Lehi bringing them out here in the middle of nowhere, and says he did it because he was a visionary man. Lehi Lehi says he accepts. He says I, I am a visionary man, and he says, and by the way, I've seen all these amazing things in visions. And later on, Laman and Lemuel pick it up and and go after Lehi and Nephi, saying, "Oh, visionary men, right?" Um, which seems to be. Uh, well, so why, why is this a striking, striking title for me? Uh, there's a book called The Dawn of Apocalyptic by Paul Hansen, okay? Um, and who, who was writing about the apocalyptic literature and trying to uh, explain where it came from. Now, apocalyptic is, is really a genre. It's not a, it's, there's no like, here's End the days. book of the apocalyptic. Yeah. yeah. Well, End of Days is a feature. That's what you call... Uh, uh, that's one of the kinds of dualism, eschatological dualism. And in the future, the world will be different, and here's how it will be different. But right? it's really revelatory. It's it's opening the windows of heaven. It's 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 visionary. It's right? visionary, absolutely. And and there are some apocalyptic books. Scholars talk about this genre. The the, the apocalyptic movement, literature, idea sort of appears in the late Old Testaments so of Daniel. Or some chapters of Daniel are commonly said to be apocalyptic. A contemporary of Lehi. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of um, intertestamental literature, stuff like First Enoch that is said to be apocalyptic. Okay, and then in the New Testament, of course, you've got things like uh, the Book of Revelation, the Apocalypse of Saint John, which is actually the the book that this whole genre takes its name from, but also Matthew twenty four the so-called so little apocalypse, okay? So it's this um, it's a genre that's spread out in different collections of books. And Paul Hansen says, where does this stuff come from? He says, probably, he makes an argument that it comes from Isaiah, that the, the apocalyptic arises among the disciples of Isaiah, 
uh, who first write extra chapters and say, Isaiah wrote this and they put it in with the rest. And, and, and it's very common uh, understanding or belief that a lot of Isaiah basically was generated that way over time. Um, and then they start writing their own books. Um, and, and he calls these, he, he, he refers to this as he calls them visionaries. So the whole time you're reading this book as a Mormon and this guy, Paul Hansen, I don't know, I can't remember what he is, but he's some kind of Christian or whatever, right? You're reading it and he's talking about the visionaries, this and visionaries that, and how much they loved Isaiah and how much they're, they, 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 uh, see themselves in Isaiah and you're just going, uh, so, um, because it sounds like Nephi, right? So uh, I don't think that Sariah made up that word. I think that was a party. And, and I think we can say some things about it. We can say that they saw themselves as associated with the prophets, that they saw Jeremiah as being, if not one of their number, at least friendly, right? At least someone they liked and were allied with, right? Maybe he was one of them. Um, we can say that their great opponent was the Jews who are at Jerusalem. Now, what does that mean? Well, it, well, a Jew in Hebrew, Yehudi, uh, is a is a Judahite. The Yehudim, the Judahites, who were at Jerusalem. This is the royal tribe, right? Uh, we live in a time when it feels awkward to be talking about the Jews who this, the Jews who that. But but all it is is these are this is the royal tribe of Judah, which is Josiah's tribe. Uh, Josiah's gone now. By the time the Book of Mormon starts. Um, and uh, who are at Jerusalem? So it's 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 not it's not an ethnic thing. It's not a, it's the people who are controlling political and religious power, right? Those are those are the opponents, and they're killing the prophets, and they and they go after Lehi, and they want to kill him, right? And um, so so one of the interesting things to realize um, is uh, history usually is written by the winner, right? The winner goes back and says, ah, I was noble and I was brave and I was faithful and did the right thing and here's how it happens. Uh, and, and then we try to sort of uh, later piece through data that might tell us how other people saw it, right? Well, here what we have is the other side. Historically, Lehi and his party are not the winner. The visionary men are the losers. It's the Jews who are at Jerusalem who have a who have a different religion, right? What what are what are Laman and Lemuel worked up about? They don't like the visions. They they say, hey, we're we're righteous. We keep the law of Moses. What's what's wrong with us? Yeah, that's one of the key things I think, Dave. That people miss on this, right? You never see them breaking the law of Moses. They're not adulterers. They're not breaking the Sabbath. They're yeah. not stealing. You know, they do want to murder, but they're doing it because of the law of Moses or how they interpret it. They're they're looking at it as, you know, Lehi and Nephi are blasphemous. Le Laman and Lemuel, they might they very well could be zealots uh, yeah. for for the law of Moses in in a Deuteron Deuteronomic fashion. Right? And so they yeah, they, we want to always kind of classify things like, well, here's the good guys and here's the bad guys. And, and we read the Old Testament and you hear about, well, the, the, the prophets are crying repentance. So he's, they're, they're, they're calling out the bad boys and girls. You know, the problem with all of that is you can't, there is no repentance from the prophets without Jesus Christ. Right. You, what are they, how are they repenting? How do they, what are they relying on? Where's their faith in? There's, repentance has to do with Christ. And so I, I look at Laman and Lemuel as they're, as they're pulling away here. They don't go to the tree. They're, they're against Laman, uh, Nephi and Lehi. Um, they're, it's almost blatant in your face that these are Deuteronomists and, and, and that if they're Deuteronomists, they're anti-Christ. Yeah. One, one of the key distinctions seems to be Lehi has visions. Actually, the visions in, Le in Nephi 1 are actually both clearly temple visions. So he has temple visions. So like one of the interesting questions is, what is the connection between the visionary men and the temple? That's an interesting question. Um, Nephi's response is, I too can have visions. Right? And so, uh, and by the way, uh, 
we haven't even talked about the word mysteries yet, but um, maybe we will. If we don't, let me say that the word mystery means an ordinance. A mystery is a long ordinance connected to a sacred drama, like the mysteries of Isis or the mysteries of Eleusis. So and, a tel- we- and a telos. You're getting to a fulfillment. It's, it's going through the initiatory That's right. So there's a transformation of the person to a new kind of a status. um, And they have they have uh, there's a salvation idea connected to it. So uh, so Nephi uh, one one, he says, because having known the mysteries of God, therefore, I write this book like we ought to be thinking, Okay, he's a visionary man. These are visions of the temple. It's because of his temple knowledge. He tells us that we that he writes the book we should be looking for this stuff but his reaction to lehi uh saying here here's the vision um his reaction to the first vision in first nephi one the double vision of the fire on the rock and the throne of god which are the same thing is nephi says i wanted to know the mysteries of god this is first nephi 2 16 i think i wanted to go and so i went and called upon the lord and in answer he appeared to me, right? So for the visionary men, God answers prayer. And indeed, he, he visits you. And in fact, it seems, that, it seems that the mysteries to the visionary men have something to do with being in the presence of God, visiting with, visiting with God, right? Whereas in, I think it's 1 Nephi 15, Lehi, Nephi's, oh, oh, okay, first, before we get there. So Nephi, um, Nephi's response to the later vision, 1 Nephi, the vision of the tree, is again, I want to know, right? And there's very provocative language in 1 Nephi 10, which echoes the Sermon on the Mount, which we may talk about, which says, look, uh, uh, the, if, if those who seek and ask can know the mysteries of God. That's, there's that language again. And it says, the, the course of the Lord is one eternal round. And boy, if that one verse didn't tip us off, uh, 195 years ago, maybe not. Maybe, maybe by the time we were 1840s, we were getting endowments in in Nauvoo. We should have said, "Oh, wait a minute! Look, look at First Nephi 10. The course of the Lord is one eternal round." We should have been thinking about this, right? So Nephi takes it seriously. My father's had this vision again. There's a temple vision that's sent through three part space from the field as wide as the world to the great and spacious building. I'll, I'll cross the straight and narrow path into the presence of the tree where everyone falls down because of the nature of the tree. Okay, that's the vision. Le- Nephi says, I want to have a vision too, and he gets one. And it's four chapters long. And then his brothers in 1 Nephi 15 says, well, tell us about what dad was going on about. And he goes, well, why don't you, why don't you ask? Go inquire the Lord. Go inquire the Lord. And they say, well, he, the Lord maketh no such thing known unto us, right? This appears to be their doctrine, right? Because, because all religion has been consolidated and centralized. If anyone is able to go and inquire of the Lord in the Deuteronomic religion, it's the high priest, right? But there is no, there is no you out there. Hey, you got a question? God will answer you. Hey, uh, are you anxious and sincere and wish to meet the Lord in person? That can happen for you too. That's, that's heretical. For the Deuteronomist, right? Yeah, the, De- the Deuteronomic, the Deuteronic, <laughs> the Deuteronomic system is very anti-democratic. It is very anti-democratic. Uh, very anti-democratic, and and it, and it's it's very therefore very anti-individualistic. Yeah, it's elitist. And there's an interesting thing. I think this is an observation Margaret Barker has made. It's interesting to think that a lot of the things that Deuteronomy forbids are the things that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob do. Build your own altar where you want, worship under a tree, uh, call on and meet with God directly, right? The stars of the heaven, the heavenly host, who are the angels and who are all the stars, it's the same thing, are part of Abraham's vision, but it's forbidden. There's forbidden in Deuteronomy. Um, uh, Abraham's not a, he's not a, Cohen, he's not a Levite. He's out there offering sacrifice anyway. And by the way, so is Lehi, right? So is Lehi. So when you hear when you hear the phrase, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like just think about that. What did Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob do? Who seems to be doing that, right? Who who seems to be in that in that religion? But so but so I think you're right. I think there's every reason to think that if we knew Laman and Lemuel. 
and if we were if we were just conventional ordinary you and I shopkeepers in Jerusalem in 600 BC and we knew all these people we might say Laman and Lemuel are yeah they're upstanding decent guys you know they yeah they're not they're not lawbreakers you know uh, Laman goes and tries to buy back the plates right it's Nephi who chops off Laban's head and steals them <laughs> Lab- so uh, I, I think there's every reason to think that Laman and Lemuel are of the reform party. They go along with their father. He's their father, maybe, right? Uh, honor thy father and thy mother is still a commandment to Deuteronomy. Yeah, I think that's uh, why they do it. Yeah, and that gets they get more and more rebellious the further it goes, right? And and when the father's gone, eventually, right? It's right after Lehi dies. First, second Nephi four, Nephi grieves, using by the way the language of the Sermon on the Mount. He's grieving. He's, he, you know, wrap me in your robe of righteousness. Keep the gate of righteousness open. Let me come in and build upon the rock. Right. That's all Temple Sermon on the Mount language. Yeah. Um, the next thing that happens is that Laman and Lemuel basically uh, this, the spirit constrains Nephi to flee because Laman and Lemuel are going to kill him. Because so it seems like it's respect for or love for their father that is keeping them. On the journey all that time. Yeah, Dave, you know, it, it seems, you know, as I look at that and I and, and, and you really when you understand that this dynamic between the one side, Laman and Lemuel and, and, and the other side with Nephi and Lehi, it's that is the entire Book of Mormon. Yeah. Right. You, you have the this sets the stage for the entire Book of Mormon and the whole history it's not just a division of the peoples. It's a division of the, theology. Yep. And, you know, the, the Lamanites, they worship. They have it in some places. They've got a, you know, that's the great spirit. And, right. And they've got their synagogue slash churches right. They're These right. are religious people. We, we've got Ammon uh, showing up during the feast. You yep. know, it, it's these are religious people, but they have a different religion that does not include Christ. Yeah, the Zoramites too. They have a religion and they have a ceremony. And they, and they leave the Nephites and they go yeah. with the Lamanites and and the Ammoniahites are are you know they've got their religion and it's it's I think when you look at this you, you say okay well what, what is the story of the Book of Mormon really about then yeah and it, it's there, there's I believe in looking at it I think the most important obviously you have another testament of Jesus Christ well how how does the Book of Mormon tell that story yeah right? it, it's it, and what you have is you have the prophets of the Nephites, the people sometimes they go in that little cycle, but then you've got the dissenters. And every one of the dissenters go over to the Lamanites. Yeah. You know, they don't go off and start their own little thing. They don't, they're, they, you have the Zoramites leave to them, the, even the, uh, the, the, the priests of Noah end up going over with the Lamanites. Uh, you've got the uh, Amalekai, uh, Amalekiah. They all end up going over and fighting and, and being with the Lamanites who are a- anti-Christ. And what I mean by that is they don't believe in Christ. They kill Abinadi because he's preaching about Christ. Yeah. And yeah. so you've got right from the beginning, Laman and Lemuel do not go to the tree. Uh, they've got a, the Deuteron- Deuteronomic uh, 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 theology in, in, with them. Yep. And, it just carries on, I think, for through the entire the entire the entire account of the Book of Mormon. Yeah, and I think I, I think this point about Christ is really important. Let me let me um, let me make a slightly not a disagreeing, but like an additional kind of characterization. Sure, a high, a high level observation about the Book of Mormon. Um, you're you're phrasing uh, your observation in terms of dissenters, and, and I think I think that. Uh, It's interesting to think about who the sort of protagonists of the Book of Mormon are. Who are these people that we follow, right? Um, Lehi has visions, abandons his wealth, runs out of the city. The if there's a dissenter, like it's probably Lehi, right? So I think I think the better the better metric is to say, look, he he was willing to follow Christ, Mm -hmm. even when the institution uh, or or because the institution would not, right? Nephi again flees from his older brothers, second Nephi five, right? You get Abinadi who preaches in disguise. 
Alma, who takes people out and they have their secret church uh, out in the thickets. You get Samuel the Lamanite, who uh, comes, sneaks up onto the wall, jumps up and says, you all are messed. <laughs> Here is the judgment coming upon you. They try to kill him and he runs away, right? Um, you, when, when we have people who, when the Book of Mormon is following people who have institutional power, what we see again and again is that they actually put it down, right? So Mosiah's sons uh, walk away from their, uh, their princely inheritances, right? Which, which got them their education. It's why they know the scriptures so well, right? It's because they're trained in the language of their father and the Egyptian, apparently. Mm -hmm. they, they walk away. None of them want to be, none of them want to be king. Uh, they want to go be missionaries. Alma, we briefly, very briefly, are, we have as our protagonist a guy, or Alma II, uh, who uh, is the, the high priest, head of the church, but for about three chapters. And then he concludes, actually, uh, this is not what I should be doing. I need to be going out and preaching repentance. And he goes and gets with Amulek, and they have a long missionary journey. You have, you have uh, uh, Mormon, right, who steps down. Uh, my people are not righteous enough for me to even the civil authority, right? Military authority. I won't exercise it. So like, I think you're absolutely right. The book of Mormon is about Christ. I think it's also, it is a visionary book. And, and there's this, there's this really interesting thing that um, by its terms, it's not the whole book. Right. First of all, by its terms, it's only like half of the unsealed part because like we lost half. Thanks, Martin. Right. But then there's the sealed part, which is apparently bigger. So there's like a whole lot more Book of Mormon we've been waiting for for 195 years. Right. So so I guess this is thing three. One, the Book of Mormon is Christ centric. Two, it is uh, visionary. Three, uh, we, we don't have all the pieces. Right. And somehow what we're doing is not enough. Um, and then four, there's this really interesting provocative. What, what do you mean by we're not doing enough? Why do you say that? Because we don't have the rest. Yeah. There's, that's, there's, that's, what I thought, that's what I thought you meant. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's something that leaves us still under condemnation, you know, and, and I am inclined to think it's not that our home teaching numbers are too low. Like I, I, I just, I don't feel that that's it. Like, I don't think that some, some set of metrics that church office building is following if we improve that like that's the answer if it feels to me like we're just somehow we're missing it right uh, let me in case anyone is now wondering i'm a member of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints so i do not attend a remnant fellowship i like <laughs> i am an elders quorum secretary right so i'm so i'm not suggesting look the answer is like abandon the church i am saying it is troubling that we are in this position. And it is it is deeply troubling. Greg, I there's a risk this conversation turns all political. That's not where I want to push this. But I find the Book of Mormon on the political front terrifyingly relevant these days. It's a very political book. Well, it, it is. Let me back up a little bit on the Christ thing, because yeah. this is... Uh, so I've, I've also gone through this quite a bit and studied this. And, and you, you, you're you bringing in Isaiah, which is, I think is really important. Yeah. Uh, to me, the entire Book of Mormon is built around Isaiah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, back in the time of Hezekiah and, and Isaiah, something very interesting happens. And that is that there is an object in the temple mm. that is called the Nehushtan. Mm -hmm. And it is the brazen serpent. Yep. Okay, this thing gets tossed out of the temple. What I, does I, the bra brazen serpent represent? Yeah, you know. So you've got a, an object here that represents Christ. Yep. That is now, now. I don't care who you are as an authority of the church or the kingdom or anyone else. How are you going to get to the point where you're going to throw out a symbol that was with Moses? And you're going to throw this out of the temple and get rid of it. Yeah. Now it says in in the historical books in the Old Testament that they threw it out because the people started to worship it and, and burned incense to it. And other, fine, I can I can see that. But whether it's the people that have changed 
who Christ was and therefore the symbol of Christ, or it's the priesthood and the king that are in on it. The fact is, it is a perfect manifestation of a loss of Christ. And this, to me, is why we have Isaiah. Yeah. Isaiah is the messianic prophet. And, and in most places throughout the Book of Mormon, the New Testament, he's just called the prophet. Right? He is the prophet. Yeah. And he's reacting. He's reacting to an environment that I would suggest the Deuteronomists have come down and, and, and started to change things. They've infested this. It acts like a virus. And they have changed the religion to be to remove Christ. Yeah. And Isaiah is fighting against this. Yeah. Right. He's out there fighting against this. And this is why Lehi and Nephi relate so well to him, because yeah. they're going through the same thing. Now, come down to the time of Josiah's reforms. And you get this thing called the Asherah that gets yep. thrown out of the temple. Well, of course, everyone says, well, of course, Asherah was thrown out of the temple. It was corrupted the temple, and it, and therefore it is, uh, it's the Canaanite goddess, and I'm glad they got rid of that. Well, hold on. As you yep. said, you know, the to the victor goes not just the spoils, but history. Yeah. And, and so this Asherah, if it is a menorah type, of an object. Yeah, it's a tree. Probably a large menorah that would have sat in the Holy of Holies. There is some references to this. Yep. And it is removed, and it is the tree of life of Lehi's vision. Yeah. And it gets tossed out. This represents, you know, you lean a little more toward toward a mother in heaven or the divine feminine, and I, and I agree that's part of it, but to me, it is also a representation of Christ. Hmm. And 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 this has now been also removed from the temple again, yeah. And, and and therefore a reaction again for Lehi in his dream, yep. Saying, okay, wait a minute, this has been thrown out. Um, he this is a response. His dream is a response to this. It, it's like no, we have to go to the tree. You don't remove the tree. You have to go to the tree, and uh, and therefore you have to go to Christ. And this has been thrown out. So you've got this precedent happening over and over again. And then Lehi and Nephi pulling in Isaiah so much, loving the words of Isaiah. And of course, there's all the prophecies and everything else. But he he is the one in that time, it looks to me like, like he's the one there fighting for Christ. Yeah. So uh, there's there's so many um, I have so many reactions to things you said. Let me let me start with the tree. One of the interesting things about the Book of Mormon. Again, I think I think we could make just a series of high level observations about the Book of Mormon that if we thought about them, it would kind of blow our minds and raise interesting questions. So uh, another so one of those is the visionary man, but another one is the tree of life. The Book of Mormon is obsessed with the tree of life. The Book of Mormon writes about the tree of life in 1 Nephi 8. Then there's an explanation of it I'm going to come back to in 1 Nephi 11. Then there's a discussion of it in 1 Nephi 15. Uh, we get discussions of it in Alma 5, uh, which is uh, a long sermon by Alma. We, Alma 32 and 33, where the poor of the Zoramites ask, how can we worship without access to the building? And uh, Alma explains how they can still access the tree of life. Um, and others, and other passages, okay, multiple uh, um, it's, it's an obsession. That's super interesting. Why are the visionary men so interested in the tree of life? Now let's rewind to Isaiah and the Nehushtan for a minute, because that's also super interesting. Um, that, the Nehushtan gets two shout outs from the Nephite prophets. One of them I think is from Alma talking to one of his sons. So it's like Alma 40 ish. Um, and I think maybe it's Cory Anthony. He's like, Hey, look, this, you just got to look to, you just got to look to it's compared the, the Nehushtan is compared to Christ. You have to look mm -hmm. to uh, being the raised up to be healed of the snake bites, and you have to look to Christ to live. And that's, by the way, that's the center of Alma thirty six. The chiasm about Alma's own conversion experience yep. is when he calls on Jesus Christ. That is the moment when he is born again, and everything turns around for him. He's telling his son to do the same. The other the other place is uh, First Nephi, I think sixteen or seventeen, maybe it's Nephi preaching to his brothers in the land of Bountiful. Now, here's a fun little parenthetical, okay? Uh, 
2013, uh, an Israeli scholar named Zioni Tzavit publishes a book called What Really Happened in the Garden of Eden. One of the I've read it. Yeah. He, tr- he, says, he says, how should we translate the name Eden? And he says, uh, bountiful. Yeah. Bountiful. Yeah, I put out an episode on that about f- oh, five you? years ago. When That's I had read awesome. that, I said, what? What okay. in the world are you saying here? Okay, so hold on, because I'm going to say something about that. So first of all, the Nephites, this name is so important, they use it in apparently the Arabian Peninsula, but also in the New World, right? But if you go look at that first Nephi, um, in the original chapter, it all happens in first Nephi 5. So I can't remember if it's first Nephi 16 and 17 or just one of those, maybe it's just 16. There's a journey in three-part space. The Nephites, the, the Le- Lehite party, goes to three named places, mm. Okay. The third, the destination is Eden. They end their journey in Eden, yep. which, and by the way, why did we call it bountiful? Because of the fruit, because of the uh, honey. Um, uh, Nephi sees the Lord there. He builds an ark there. And the all of the analogs for the ark in ancient Egypt are boats. So there is this sort of interesting idea that the ark is some kind of a cousin to or in some sense is thought of as a boat okay uh nephi goes and builds a boat of worked timbers of curious workmanship and this is where okay in eden the third part of this three-part journey he talks about the nehushtan okay which uh if hebrews uh is right uh let's see is it hebrews uh yeah uh, no, no, that's that's manna. The, the Nehushtan, if it's kept in the Holy of Holies, this is the room where it appears, right? Mm-hmm. And this it, that is Eden, the third room in the temple. By the way, the second name place they go to, this is all a parenthetical, is Nahum, which ap- appears to be an existing name, right? A lot's been written about that. Mm-hmm. The fundamental meaning of the word Nahum is comfort. And I don't think we're going to have time to talk about this today, but... That ascent through three-part space that's in Exodus 24, that's in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the markers of it is that in the second space, you have a feast with the Lord. This is what the elders of Israel do in Exodus 24. It's what people in in Matthew 6 do. And the mark of that feast is comfort. It's Psalm 23, my rod and my staff comfort you. Mm -hmm. Um, It's also Moroni's sacramental prayers. You, the blessing that they may have his Holy Spirit to be with them is the presence of the comforter. So we have this three-part journey. The second part, the part where you should be having a feast with the Lord, is indeed marked. It's named comfort. The third part is named, apparently, Eden. The first part... I'm, I'm sorry. I, maybe I'm getting ahead of you. So the second part being the holy place would be where the correct. bread of the presence is and the wine. Correct. correct. Um, and the first room, the first space in this three-part named journey... Uh, uh, they call it Shazer or Shazer. This is an interesting um, uh, root. If you look it up in, in dictionaries, it says that the verb uh, means to twist. It only appears in one form in the Old Testament. It appears only in the book of Exodus. It appears about 20 times. And that form is Mashzar. So the verb is shazar, it, it appears mashzar, and what it means is uh, twined. And so every, t- every time, and it's like 20 times in the book of Exodus, that the priest's robes, the door to the temple, the veil to the temple, the hangings that make up the walls of the temple, is the construction is described, it's, and it says it's fine twined linen, that's Shazer, that's Shazar, that's Mashzar. So we have this really, this journey in three-part space with these very temple resonant words. And at the, at the end of it, Nephi is talking about, among other things, the Nehushtan. Now, let's talk about Isaiah and the Nehushtan. Um, I just, again, I'm reading this commentary these days, um, the Hermeneia commentary for first Isaiah, J.J. M. Roberts is the author. And in his commentary on Isaiah 6, so remember Isaiah 6, as I was in the temple, I saw the Lord lifted up and his, uh, the, the King James says his train filled the temple. It's, 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 the, it's his skirt. Uh, uh, actually, what it says is it filled the hay call. It filled the second room where I was standing. He's, on, he's, up, on the, he's up on the throne, but, he, but the God king. is giant and, and I am you know, within the perimeter of his skirts. 
and uh, and a seraph comes forward, right? Okay. So the commentary Jim Roberts makes about that is, and he's not alone in thinking this. Margaret Barker has said this. Lots of other scholars have said this. The seraph is probably a snake. Mm -hmm. It's a winged snake. Okay, there's a lot of examples from this time of snakes with two or four wings representing the kings of Judah or representing like a divine being that protects the king of Judah. Okay, but like the text where you really see it is Numbers 21, which is the Nehushtan text, because uh, because uh, the, the serpents are out, they're biting everyone. God says to Moses, go and get a saraf, go and get a seraph. And Moses gets or makes a Nahash, a serpent, and puts it on the pole, and that's the Nehushtan. And, and so Robert says, um, the, the seraph, the seraphim, which means burning ones, are, should be understood to be winged, venomous snakes. Mm -hmm. And do they have hands? They actually have hands, but that's because, the, you know, there were no, in fact, winged, venomous snakes in Judea. This is, a, this is like a mythological Right, it's a vision creature. So, uh, and and by the and so Robert says this is interesting. He says um, this uh, that Isaiah thinks that that's the Nehushtan that he's basing his vision on things that were really in the temple. There's really the ark. Uh, there's really this Nehushtan. Right. So so yes, Hezekiah in Second Kings eighteen four, um, who's uh, who's he comes, Isaiah is, if we take what, what is said about Isaiah in the book of Isaiah and Kings seriously, Isaiah is already in his career as prophet when Hezekiah comes on the throne. Mm -hmm. right? So yeah, he, he was with the prior king. Yeah, Uzziah, right, in the, uh, is where Isaiah starts. Um, but uh, whereas Hezekiah takes down the Nehushtan, Isaiah 6 tend to suggest that Isaiah f finds the Nehushtan to be a divine being, mm -hmm. that it's the Nehushtan who is a seraph who commissions Isaiah. Okay, so, so and, and why is it interesting? Well, because I actually think that the same thing is true with respect to the Asherah. And um, I think you and I don't have time to go into all the details, but let me just tell you very quickly at a high level what I think. And then I'm going to point you at the text in the Book of Mormon that really got me started down this, because this is really, this is a, this is, my journey is a Book of Mormon journey. I have read the, the Bible in Hebrew and Greek, okay? Um, but I, my journey is not a, I went to Harvard Theological Seminary and, and read critical scholarship. It's, it's me trying to figure out what makes the Book of Mormon make sense. Yeah, that's probably a positive uh, in many cases. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why I still believe in God. <laughs> so, so, um, so uh, if you look at Isaiah 3 through 6, okay, I'm just going to tell you how I read them um, and tell you why I think that. Um, you can go look it up on your own, but then I'll, I'll talk about the Book of Mormon. So these four chapters, I read them like, um, uh, like a call and a response and then a call and a response. Okay. It's, it's a structured text. And, and, and the call is there is a catastrophe. There is an apostasy in my day. Here's what heaven does about it. So that's Isaiah three and then Isaiah four. And then Isaiah five is a different account of the same catastrophe. And Isaiah six is a uh, more detail on or a different account of heaven's response. Okay. So I think, I think we should take Isaiah three through six seriously as describing Isaiah's experience of um, the beginning of his ministry, the apostasy and how he comes to, to be the prophet he is and why, and why he prophesies the way he does. OK. And by the way, we should we should bear in the back of mind that Nephi several times compares himself to Isaiah. And so I think we should we should like this this for this all to ring true. We need to be able to go. Yeah, OK. Isaiah has some stuff in common with Nephi. They've got, you know, this apparently poetic, uh, very well educated court prophet and, you know, Nephi, the wild man, chopping off his cousin's head and stealing the books, right, must, like, what, how, why does Nephi look at that guy and say, I am like him, right? Okay, Isaiah 3, 
apostasy. There is a crisis of leadership. Okay, there is said to be uh, no bread. Uh, there um, uh, said that all, all various leaders and skilled people in Jerusalem are missing or will be taken away. Uh, we, we grab a brother in the house of the father and say, will you be the leader? And he says, no, I have no bread and I have no clothing. I cannot be a healer. Okay. Um, there's a super interesting Isaiah 3, 9 says, um, they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. And I'm going to come back to that. That, that matters. So in this apostasy, and I don't think this is about homosexuality. OK, but 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 these people are proudly doing something the sodomites did as part of their apostasy. And uh, in all of this, uh, late in the chapter, uh, there is a there is a reassurance. Uh, the right tell say to the righteous, they will still be able to eat the fruit. OK, that's Isaiah three. What is the response? Isaiah four, seven men take hold, seven women take hold of a man. Now, I don't think that's about polygamy. OK, OK. Um, um, let me just leave that where it is. Come, we may come back to it. Uh, they take, they, they say, Hey, uh, we will provide the bread. We will provide the clothing, right? These are the things that were missing in chapter three. So I, this is why I think it's a, it's a call and response because chapter four echoes chapter three. I don't think that's accidental. We'll provide the bread. We'll provide the clothing. We just need someone to bear the name. Um, and uh, there is a there is a and, and there is a statement that the righteous will be able to eat the fruit. OK, so I think that's uh, that's sort of the the also in Isaiah four, there is some Exodus imagery where there's a, a cloud of smoke and a pillar of fire. And they go on they go to every dwelling place on Mount Zion, which is interesting. I don't know what to make of it, but it feels to me, Greg, like um Hey, if the official temple is inaccessible, if it's corrupted, the new exodus is going to be into every dwelling place, right? That's, that's, that's straight interpretation. That's, that's what it seems like to me. But okay, deficit of leadership. These seven women grab a man and hey, you, we need you to bear the name. Isaiah 5. Um, Isaiah 5, um, I'm going to tell you some things about the Hebrew. You can go look them up, okay? Isaiah 5 starts out, says, let, let me sing, or now let me sing a song about uh, my beloved in his vineyard. And you read that in Hebrew. The striking thing is that the first word in this chapter is Asherah. Asherah is not the same as Asherah, but it's oh so close. The only difference is it has a jot, a yod, like a letter I in it. Shear is a song or sing. Ashir is I sing. Ashir ah means let me sing. Now may I sing. Okay. But chapter six, sorry, five opens with what looks like the name Ashira. And in case you didn't get the reference, it's in this little parable about vines. Yeah, like we get in the New Testament. Uh, yes, that's right. Matthew Matthew plays on this, and Enoch does also. Right. This and and in those in those passages, this is understood to be a parable about the temple. Okay, so temple language, tree language, Ashira. Now six thirteen. So that's five one through four or something. Six thirteen says something like the King James is something like uh, yet a 10th shall return and it shall be as a teal tree and as an um, oak. oak. Yeah. Um, again, the Hebrew here is really striking because a 10th is Assyria, hmm. which again, sounds a lot like Asherah. So an, an Assyria shall return. And again, we're given a tree context. It'll be like a teal tree and like an oak. And by the way, a teal, the teal tree, or it's translated as a terebinth in some versions, the Hebrew there is Elah. Elah is also readable straight up as goddess. El is a god, the father god. god. Yeah. Elah. Awesome. Hebrew is kind of like Spanish. You add an ah on the end of most things that makes them feminine, right? So Ish is a man, Isha is a woman. Sus is a stallion, Susa is a mare. El is god, 
a law. Yeah, it's the word for a terebinth, but also it's straight up readable as a goddess, right? So this Isaiah 6.13 says, Asriya, a tenth, will return. It will be like Elah, a goddess. By the way, the I think the... Um, I think the King James uses oh, some word like source or something in there, um, uh, which other uh, twice in the verse, which other um, substance. substance, that's what it is, substance. Other translations uh, say this is the root or the stump. The word is actually a matzebet, okay, which means a pillar. So it does mean like a stump, but it also means a standing stone. So when you read the Deuteronomy is talking about the going down the high places, knocking down the standing stones, they're knocking down the matzibot. This is the same word. Okay. So Atsira will return. It will be like the goddess, like a teal tree, like an oak. And, you know, enough strength remains in the matzibot that it can all come back. Right. So again, we have five and, and six, a kind of call response with, man, this big old looks like a shout out to Asherah. What it looks like, you read the Hebrew, okay? Now, um, I'll point out two other passages, one and five and one and six. You and I don't have time to walk through everything here, okay? Uh, five, 18 through 20. So, uh, and by the way, Roberts' commentary, the commentary on verses 18 and 19 is awesome. He says, this is clearly an oracle of judgment. I can't figure out what the sin is supposed to be here. So um, 18 says something like, Woe unto them who sin, uh, who draw iniquity as it were with cords of vanity, okay, who sin by hauling on a cart rope, something like that, right? Um, I get why this does not seem like a very clear description of a sin, but I think what we ought to imagine, as you say, later Josiah burns the Asherah and grinds the ashes to nothing in the Kidron brook, okay? Hezekiah is said to have cut down the Asherah, karat. He cut down the Asherah. Not totally clear what that verb means. Um, I think what we should imagine here is something very literal in this verse. People have something heavy in ropes, and they're pulling it. And what that something heavy could be is a big gold menorah, a tree lamp, which also is an Asherah, which would have been, according to visionary accounts like First Nephi 8 and the Sermon on the Mount, in the Holy of Holies, and they're moving it. Okay, that's verse 18. Woe unto those guys. Now, verse 19. Okay, verse 19, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but they say like, uh, make him hurry up, hasten the work, that let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel come forth that we may know it. Something like that, right? Okay. Is that the sword? Yeah. Well, so not not the sword. Gosh. So the, the word here is etzah. So it's S-E-L, not C-I-L. Etzah. Now, etzah is very close to etz. Again, it's like sus, susa, ish, isha. Etzah looks like the feminine of etz. Okay, etza does mean council, but etz means tree. Mm -hmm. So the etza of the Holy One of Israel looks like it means the tree lady, the feminine tree of the Holy One of Israel. Let the, let the tree, the tree lady of the Holy One of Israel come forth that we may know her. Now, by the way, remember that Isaiah 3, 9 says, um, they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. So if you go look at Genesis 19, 5, the messengers have come to Lot's house. And the men of Sodom come bang on the door and they say, send the men out mm -hmm. that we may know them. So that is the same, that we may know them, Ned, uh, is, this, is the same word here in Hebrew. It's the same image. Send it out. Send the tree out that we may know her. Now, in the King James translation, it's sort of baffling. It looks like, I, it looks like they're saying, they're asking for a nice thing. I want to understand the advice of the Holy One of Israel. That's not it at all. It's send the tree out 
so that we can sexually assault her. And they echo the language of Genesis 19.5. And this is why Isaiah says, their sin is as Sodom, they hide it not. Hmm. Now that's 18 and 19. Verse 20 confirms this reading for us, and then I'm going to go to the Book of Mormon. Okay, Verse 20 says, uh, woe unto those that call good evil and evil good. Okay, I think we're talking about the same people. They're, 2 Kings 18.4, they're patting themselves on the back. I, Hezekiah got rid of the Asherah. Yeah, that was some pagan garbage. And Hezekiah, put it, yeah. right? Calling evil good. Um, but then it says, uh, woe unto them that put light for darkness, darkness for light, that put bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. So um, they're, they're not calling anymore. They're moving something. They're putting something. Well, if you put light for darkness, darkness for light, that's a pretty good description of taking the light that was in the Holy of Holies that's supposed to be there. All the visionary accounts put the light in the Holy of Holies. And you move that into the center room, then the Holy of Holies, the place of light and life, becomes darkness. And the center hall that's supposed to be dark and smoky becomes light, right? You're placing light for darkness, darkness for light. The, the order, well, so the third thing, that plays bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You got to see three other texts alongside this one. The first is Exodus 15. So the first part of Exodus 15 is the so-called Song of the Sea. It's this, this whole chapter is super old poetry and it, 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 it's in context, it's supposed to be about Yahweh defeating the Egyptians. Maybe it's even older than that. And it's about Yahweh defeating his cosmic enemies and building the temple hill on their bones. Okay. But the story in the second half is that the Israelites come along to a place called Mara. Well, Mara means bitter. Mm -hmm. And they can't drink the waters. There are waters of Mara. They can't drink them. God has a solution. God gives Moses a tree, an etz. And when Moses puts the tree in the water, it turns the water from Mara, bitter, to Matok, sweet. Now this, by the way, we're going to get back to Isaiah uh, 5 here, but, but this explains something really odd about 1 Nephi. Because when Nephi, Lehi has the vision, Nephi asks to understand it, he's given his own vision to explain. First Nephi 11, 25, um, he sees that the iron rod is the word of God, the tree is the love of God, the waters were also a representation of the love of God. Okay, that's what he sees. Then his brothers say, hey, you explain us this thing, dude. And, uh, and he first of all says, why don't you ask? But they're not going to get their own vision. So he gives them very truncated, limited explanations, okay? Including an explanation about the water. And I forget what verse this is, but he says the water is the filthy depths of hell. Now, isn't that interesting? Because that's not the answer he got in chapter 11. He was told it was the love of God. How is that possible? Well, remember the vision Lehi, from the point of view of the vision, he's all the, he walks all the way to the end. He's by the tree. Okay? Laman and Lemmy don't get that far. They go a little way and then they stop. Right? I, don't, I can't remember. I don't think we hear whether they turn off into the great and spacious building or what. But they don't. I don't go to the great and spacious building. They wander off into the field. They wander off. Yeah. Right? How can the river both be the love of God and the and the filthy depths of hell well the answer is that the presence of the tree makes the river sweet hmm. okay where the tree is it's sweet where it's not where Laman and lemuel are it is bitter right which to come back to isaiah 5 they call good evil and evil good they place they put darkness for light and light for darkness they call uh, they put sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet if they move the tree they move the sweetness forward and, the, and they move the bitter back, right? Now, all of that is my reading of Isaiah. And, and, and I get people are going to be saying, 
well, A, I don't read Hebrew, and like Dave is saying this, but Dave is just this goofy looking guy in an office somewhere, and why, right? Dave is an elders quorum secretary by his own admission. Why should I listen to Dave? <laughs> I will say real quick, Dave, it's yeah. interesting because I've got a note here from many years back in my gospel library, and I'm looking at this note here, and it says, all it says is, like the fruit of the tree. <laughs> it's sweet. Like yeah, that's all I've got there is, is written on, on verse 20 there. Yeah, First Nephi 8.10. The, the fruit was very sweet and uh, desirable to make one happy. Yeah. And by the way, as I'm saying this, Greg, I am cherry picking a straight line through. There are all kinds of other little things sure. on the site. But let me come back to like the, the whammy, the punch you in the face, which isn't Isaiah. Because, man, we most of us just read the King James and we're like, ah, okay. Um, it's, it's Nephi. So Nephi wants a vision of what his father saw. Okay. And, uh, first Nephi 11, oh, I think it's like six to 15, something One like of my that. favorite chapters. Yeah. This is such, this is, this goes to the heart of like, what is the book of Mormon about? And it goes to the heart of like the whole tree of life thing. All this to me, Greg, I, I think this is like, Right out the, at the edge. This is the stuff we're supposed to be trying to figure out so we can get more. That's what I, that's what I think. So uh, the Nephi says, I want to see what my father saw. Angel says, cool, here's a tree. The tree's white and beautiful. And Nephi says, I want to know what the tree means. And, and the angel says, cool. And shows him, uh, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Shows him, first of all, a vision of cities. Now, that's probably a discourse for another time, okay? But for Isaiah, cities are women. Like, Zion, is, the city of Jerusalem is the daughter of Zion, who is a kind of a divine woman. She's dressed like she's a goddess the whole time, okay? So, um, the answer to the question, what is the tree that is white and beautiful, is that the angel shows Nephi a woman who is white and beautiful. Now, that's the answer he gets. The tree with the delicious sweet fruit, desirable to make you happy, is a woman with a baby in her arms. Now, the answer he gives Laman and Lemuel, they go, uh, and what is the tree, my bro? And uh, he says, it's the tree of life. Now, he's giving them simpler answers, but he's not giving them false answers. But one thing that tells us is, well, if we read First Nephi 11, it's not as simple as, oh, he was shown, you know, the tree is a symbol of Mary. Like, it's not that simple because the tree is a tree of life. Nephi says that. So we have, we have an idea. We have a symbol. We have a, we, have a, we have a nexus of meaning here, okay, where the tree is the tree of life, is the mother of the fruit desirable to make one happy. Um, that, that's, all, that's all one thing. And by the way, in 1 Nephi 8.30, when people come into the presence, and again, I've said this, we're probably not going to talk about it very much more today, but uh, that is an, 1 Nephi 8 is an ascent through three-part space. It is a temple ascent because the, the Solomon's temple is three levels, three, three parts. And it ends with going through the straight and narrow path. Someone or something who is the word of God, you grasp it four times and you enter into the presence of the tree. And in 830, what Nephi says is people, when they come in the presence of the tree, they fall down. Now, he doesn't say more than that, but it's really striking because in the ancient East, the Near East, in the presence of a divinity or a king, and the, the line between those is often very fine, you didn't bow from the waist, okay? Like, yeah, like prostrate. Yeah, you lay flat. Mm -hmm. Okay, Herodotus talks about this. He's a Greek about Lehi's time, and he's kind of he's like, you'll never believe what these crazy people in Asia do when they get into their king's. Place, they lie all the way flat on the ground, not like us civilized Greeks. Okay, that I think is what we're seeing here is when you enter into the presence of the tree, and I think you're in the presence of the mother and the son, because the son is clearly the fruit, or at least the son is here, right? I think the tree is the mother and the son is the fruit. 
Um, again, there's other trails we could go down to kind of talk about that. People fall down. Again, they don't think they're in the presence of Mary. They're responding like they're in the presence of a divine being. Right. And and that's just straight. That's just straight Book of Mormon. So for me, the Isaiah stuff is interesting. It's it's telling. It raises lots of questions and mysteries. But I think although Heze although Isaiah appears to be a court prophet and appears to be trying to always get Hezekiah to remember his covenants with God as king, he clearly disagrees with the policy of removing the Nehushtan. And I think he, to me, it seems very clear from Isaiah 5 and 6 that he disagrees with removing the Asherah. And I think he is fundamentally the founder of the party of the visionary men. I think the visionary men are people who um, uh, are adopting the method of Isaiah. Now, give me a second. I'm going to say at least one last thing about the method of Isaiah here. Um, they, uh, they are rooted in the temple ideologically. It is a more democratic temple order than the one that's described in, in Kings and Chronicles because you don't appear to have to be a, a Levite or a Kohen, right? You appear to have to be a keeper of covenants. And they believe that God can appear to you. And the testimony of Lehi and Nephi is that he does, right? And that you can be, you can be guided by visions and, and, um, and they see themselves in Isaiah because he's the founder of their movement. And because in an apostasy in his day, Isaiah, Isaiah does a, takes an action to kind of escape. Like they are taking an action to escape fleeing, uh, fleeing Jerusalem. Now, the Isaiah method. Okay. I'll just quote a few more verses. Greg, I know we're going long. You're fine. Keep going. Okay. All right. But, but we've all we may I got a question for you though, but but keep going. Okay, okay. Isaiah six. Okay, and I'm doing all of this without the verses in front of me. So so hopefully you're you're checking on me and making sure I'm at least close. Isaiah's called, right? He's in the temple, God is in the throne, his his skirt fills fills the room. The seraph, the Nehushtan comes forward. I think you're right. I think that is a representation of Christ. Uh, I mean, that's what Nephi says, right? It's what Alma says burns his burns his lip and he gets the strangest prophetic commission ever because he is told to prophesy in a way that people won't understand that their ears won't hear their heart will be fat so they won't understand they won't understand they won't repent they won't be healed that is the commission that Isaiah received now how weird is that but by the way we see that uh, we see that in uh, Matthew 13. Okay, Matthew 13. Mm, I forget the verses, but it's the middle of the chapter. It's like 10 through 17 or something. Okay, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and they say, "Hey, why do you speak in parables?" And Jesus says, uh, "I speak in parables because you, your eyes have seen." the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And there's that word mysteries again. Therefore, you understand the parables and you learn. But those people, they out there, the crowd, have not seen the mysteries. And I speak in a way that you have to have seen the mysteries to understand what I'm talking about. So, you, so I do that so you understand and they do not. And they do not. And then he quotes Isaiah 6. He quotes that same passage. And he, I, now he says, Matthew says something like fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. Matthew likes to um, have these kind of fulfillment formulas that Jesus does a thing or Joseph does a thing and it fulfills a prophecy, right? But I think you could also say following the method of Isaiah. Now let me just point out two real quick Book of Mormon Nephi passages on this same point, okay? Second Nephi 32.4. Second, at Second Nephi 32, 4, he's, he's winding up, and he has been talking about some kind of a journey that you, the reader, can be on, which involves developing faith, hope, and charity, and persevering all the way to the end, and walking, in the, yeah, walking in the straight and narrow path, and doing the things you have seen Jesus do, and, uh, and speaking the tongues of angels. And then in Second Nephi 32, 4, he says, if you do not understand these things, it will be because you have not asked and knocked and you have not been brought forward into the light 
but you stay outside and perish in darkness. Now, let's just think about this for a second, okay? Let's assume that he's making a metaphor here. And, the, and what he really means is you've got to pray to find an answer. Even if that's true, for him to make that metaphor, he has to assume that to his readers, something about standing in a straight and narrow path, asking and knocking and then being admitted into the light, something about that is familiar to them so he can make the metaphor. Otherwise, that doesn't mean anything. Sure. But I think it's more than a metaphor. I think Nephi is literally saying, I am speaking to those of you who have advanced through a straight and narrow path where you have to ask for admission, you have to knock, and, and if you are granted admission, you're pulled forward from darkness into light. And I think this is the same thing he's talking about in 2 Nephi 25, 1, where he talks about the way Isaiah prophesies and how, his, how Nephi's own children don't understand because they don't understand the manner of prophesying among the Jews. Now, it's not the manner in which the Jews prophesy. It's the manner of prophesying among the Jews. And I think what Nephi understands is that Isaiah basically took upon himself a kind of a secret prophet status where he wrote using temple imagery so that those who had ears to hear would understand those who had had the right experiences would recognize his images and, and understand what he was talking about. And those who didn't, those who hadn't asked, knocked, and been admitted from darkness into light would, would not follow at all. I think Matthew has Jesus following in Isaiah's footsteps. I think Nephi has himself following in Isaiah's footsteps. And I think this is one of the, uh, we're clearly not going to get to talk about the Sermon on the Mount stuff today. Probably not. But I think this is one of the um, this is one of the great keys that we need to be using to try to under, unlock the Book of Mormon and move forward is applying a temple understanding to what. Yeah, see, that's what you're saying, which is really interesting because it's and, and, and I be, believe this full heartedly. But but it's okay if you've gone through the temple, if you've really understood the temple, then all of a sudden, what should happen is you should understand the scriptures. Yeah. At a, in a completely different way, but we don't usually do that. We don't understand the, the that these things are the same, right? These these prophets have gone through the rites, they've gone through the temple, they've done these things, and so they're writing about them. This is their anchor, right? That they're that they're using and they're talking about. When we have the visions, the visionary men, whether it's um, you know, Isaiah in Isaiah 6, or, or you've got Lehi in Nephi, 1 Nephi 1. Um, you've got um, John in the book of Revelation, chapter 4 or 5, I can't remember. But it, it's the same thing wherever there's a throne theophany. We, it, it is a temple vision, and we need to see that that's what's going on. Yeah. And why is the temple so central? Because you're picking out all of these verses here that you would normally just kind of blow by because you don't understand it. Right. Why are all of these verses right about the temple? Why why are they talking about the temple? Well, because then you can have context and right. an understanding it from the temple knowledge, which is what it really tells you in eight section 84. Yep. The knowledge that you gain going through the temple. And I'm not talking about watching the drama. Right. Right. It is through the covenants and the ordinances and everything goes around them that you actually pick up knowledge. Yep. And, and that knowledge can be applied to the scriptures. And I think should be. Mm -hmm. I think, look, not only does 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 uh, Nephi say that, you know, Isaiah is, is, is a great prophet and his, he'll all be fulfilled. and We need to be paying attention. But Jesus in third Nephi 23. Right. Not a lot of people get a direct Jesus endorsement. Uh, Isaiah <laughs> does. That's yeah. a that's a coveted endorsement. Uh, uh, I I think that's absolutely right. And and I think maybe we'll come back and talk about this another time, where people can can look at this on their own. But um, to give like a thirty thousand foot summary, um, and this is this is not my idea. Um, uh, originally, this is a Jack Welch wrote a yeah. couple of books. Yeah, about I've read I've read that paper. Yeah, and. Uh, 
the Sermon on the Mount can be read as an ordinance in three-part space by which you enter into the presence of God. And so one of the reasons, going back to like the, the, the high-level questions about the Book of Mormon, one of the questions is why is the Book of Mormon always quoting the, even just like a few words at a time, why does it always have Sermon on the Mount imagery? Why is 2 Nephi 4 and 2 Nephi 2 and 2 Nephi 9 and Alma 32 and 3, why are they full of the same stuff that's in the Sermon on the Mount? Well, the answer is they're not quoting the Sermon on the Mount. They're doing it. They're doing it. <laughs> they know it as an ordinance. It's older than Jesus. The Sermon Matthew yes. does not say Jesus now made up this sermon and gave it. It yeah. says he sat and taught them. Well, it's interesting. At the very beginning of chapter five, I point this out to people. It says, this is, I'm reading the King James version here. It says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. Of course, that represents a, a temple yes. setting. And then he says, and then, and then, and then Matthew says, and when he was set, yep. his disciples came on it. What, what do you mean when he was set? Yeah. Right. What did he put together what what is going on what are the objects you know what did he did he move furniture or bring that with him or objects to, something is being set I, I like that take yeah if if you if you uh this is probably another conversation but like if you you know try this experiment someday get up on a pulpit just like when no one's in the sac in the chapel go and stand and just just read the sermon on the mount as if you're delivering it as a sermon it doesn't make any sense as a sermon right but and again, it's about three hours to walk, two and a half hours to walk through this. Um, it makes a lot of sense as an ordinance. Now, again, there, there. If you can, see, if you can read it in Greek, you will see some things that you can't see in English. But you can see most of it in English. Um, there are three rooms in the Temple Ascent. There are three three chapters in in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Nephi quotes it all the time. The Matthew 7, the climax is you ask, seek, and knock after your last warning about judgment and don't throw, uh, don't put sacred things to, before pigs, to swine, all right? You ask, seek, and knock. Uh, you pass through a straight and narrow gate and you see a tree with good fruit. Neph this is the same thing as when Nephi talks about uh, Lehi's dream as reported by Nephi. People coming along a straight and narrow path to a tree with good fruit, right? This is this is the Isaiah temple order, the pre-Hezekiah, the non-Deuteronomic order of the temple is that the tree of light and life is in the final room. Yeah. It also puts, it, it can put, this is, yeah, this puts this uh, this verse into, into context a little bit. If what we're saying is what it is, what you're saying is what it is. If you go to verse 15, and in, in, in Matthew five, it says, yeah. "Neither do men light a candle." Right mm -hmm. now, a candelaria is a menorah. Yeah. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. Yeah. Put on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. It's kind of interesting. It tells you that the menorah is coming, and it also says you are the light of the world. Yeah. This is You're the light. This yeah. is the ordinance about becoming those who shine. Mm -hmm. And Matthew in Matthew 13 and Alma in I think Alma 5 both say mm -hmm. the righteous shine in the kingdom of God. This yeah. is the ordinance of how you enter the kingdom of God. So here, here I want to get back to this. I had a I had a couple of discussions with uh, Val Larson. Oh yeah. Val is a big Margaret Barker fan. He's a big Dave Butler fan. He's read all your stuff and and and, and kind of goes right along with all that. And I, I addressed this with him, but I didn't do it satisfactorily. Okay. Um, here's the issue I have with the Tree of Life being just Asherah. Okay. Okay. Um, so in chapter, if, if you go back into um, the ancient Near, Near East, and mm -hmm. you look at other religions mm -hmm. at the time, uh, you do have a representation of women with trees. I mean, in, in Egyptian uh, uh, religion, when you die, you're going to go right by Hathor Isis, who's in a tree. Yep. Right? And you're going to pass through there. She may offer you something to eat. And then you're going to go with Anubis, and you're going to go into the underworld. And But when you come back out the other side, there's there's a woman with a tree, the same thing again, right? So, so that exists, but you also have 
the king is typically also portrayed as a as a tree. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily other men, but the king is represented also a, as a tree. So you've got really Hathor Isis, who's the mother, and then the son would be the king, right? right? Because the mother is the throne. The mother represents the throne. And uh, and 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 you know, and and the, and the son is sitting in the throne, right? Which is also why you might look at the tree of life possibly being the throne of God, you know, and getting getting the throne of God. But in chapter eleven of First Nephi, two times the angelic host says, "Do you know the condescension of God?" Mm-hmm. And the first time he does that, that's when he goes to Mary. Right, so it's how we usually think of condescension, where where you know basically Jehovah comes down, is born of a woman, and takes on a mortal experience, right? Mm-hmm. But then he says again, "Do you know the condescension of God?" As if it's not fully explained. Mm-hmm. And this time he goes to John the Baptist, right? And and in many ways, what you get there the second time is what we have as another birth, right? Which is being born again of the water. And the spirit, and 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 so it, it's it's like you're wait a minute. The condescension of God isn't done yet. There's a birth to Mary, but then there's also a a birth to the water. Now there are waters there with the tree of life, so you can see that as kind of maybe hey maybe there's something there to that being coupled together. But as you go through it, it's still to me a uh, a discussion of Christ. Mm-hmm. Right. And, 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 and so I, I do think it is the divine feminine. I do think that there is, you know, it's probably Mary as a put in place, used as a placemaker, so to say, of, of a divine heavenly mother. Mm-hmm. But it, I think it, it just seems to me like it's both. And, and, and I think that the way you describe it is the tree is the mother and the fruit is the son. That's how I write. Yep. Okay. Um, so that could be, but he does, but the angelic host starts off saying, do you understand, do you believe what your father said about the tree? Which is always also just so interesting that he goes right to that. Right. The Book of you Mormon's know. obsessed with the tree. Yeah, he's obsessed with the tree. And, and, and But he's answering what the tree is. And mm-hmm. it, isn't he giving a narration of, of, of Christ being born to Mary and then born of the water? The woman is white and beautiful, and the tree is white and beautiful. True. The the um, so there's a whole other complex of things here that make me think that Christ is the fruit in this vision. I do think the vision is about Christ. It is about Christ in the tree. So there's Isaiah nine. Okay, um, is about conventional commentator Jim Roberts will say, well, this is like. Uh, maybe it's about Hezekiah specifically. It's about the Davidic king. Uh, in Isaiah 9, there are a series of throne names um, which uh, which everyone recognizes because we sing them in Handel's Messiah every December. Wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. That's what Those are the King James translations of the Hebrew. Um, the Greek has none of those. The Greek says... Uh, he is the it just gives one title. He is the which is an earlier version, which which may be. Well, well, may well be like you've got the Septuagint. Right, it was translated in 300 BC. Yeah. So it was the the argument is that sometimes, and this has been vindicated, like like sometimes. So so the famous example is uh, in Deuteronomy where uh, the um, Hebrew says. Uh, God divided the earth according, uh, or the earth was divided according to the sons of Israel. And the Greek says it was divided according to the sons of God. God, yeah. And when the Dead Sea Scrolls version showed up, they agreed with the Greek. Yes. And so it turned out that this had been probably deliberately changed by later scribes. And the reason is the, the idea that the world is divided according to the sons of God expresses an old idea that the rabbis didn't like. And the idea was that every nation had its own, every nation had a son of God at the head of it, like a, like a national God, like Baal was a son of God and Yahweh was a son of God and who, you know, Osiris was a son of God, right? Uh, The the rabbis 
really didn't like that, so they changed, God, you know, sons of God to son of Israel. But the, the, the Greek, the point is, the Greek was vindicated. Sometimes the Greek holds older readings. Um, we don't know for sure. We have to argue about it. <laughs> so the Greek in this case only has one title for the Davidic king or for Jesus, and that is the angel of great counsel. Okay, the messenger of great counsel. Now I think that counsel E L or I O E L E L. I think the great, great counsel in uh, Isaiah five and, and elsewhere is is the tree. Now I, I think about that. The angel, the sent one. The messenger of the tree is a very interesting way to think about Jesus, whose birth we celebrate under a tree and who died nailed to a tree, right? There's, that's, that's interesting. The, getting, getting back to, you touched on this, right? There's, there's showbread. Leviticus 24 has showbread in the temple. Aaron and his sons eat the bread of the presence in the temple. Um, there's another reference to bread in the temple, which is uh, manna. Manna is some is uh, it's not described as being bread in the book of Numbers, right? It's it, it literally manna means what is it? <laughs> it's it's what you call it. That is, by the way, white and tastes like honey. Um, but uh, I think Numbers or Exodus says that there's it is kept in the presence of the Lord. And Hebrews 9, 3 says it's actually in the ark, mm -hmm. that a pot of manna is kept in the ark. Okay. Jesus refers to the manna in John 6 as bread. He calls it the bread of heaven. And then he identifies himself as the bread of heaven. Your fathers ate the bread of heaven, i.e. manna, and died. Whoever eats me, the bread of heaven, will live forever. He compares himself to manna that kind of bread in the heaven. Uh, Leviticus 24, Aaron and his sons um, eat the showbread, which, by the way, is flavored with frankincense, which is very interesting. So it's like an orange bread or has an orangey kind of citrusy flavor to it. Um, they do it as a zikaron, as a memorial um, offering, okay, memorial sacrifice. It's not clear what that means. Margaret Barker has argued that, that maybe should be read to be something else other than mem memorial because because the same root can be read to mean something like uh, evoke, like summoning, okay? But I actually think memorial is probably the right answer, is the right understanding, because Jesus in Luke 22, when he's meeting with his disciples in an upper room, and by the way, here again, we have three-part space. We go into an upper room, I have a feast with my disciples, then we go up to the Mount of Olives where the tree is. OK, it's the, it's always the same, Greg. It is always the same in that middle room. When he passes out the bread, he says, eat this in remembrance of me. And I think he uses the word now, of course, we had it's it's, it's Greek versus Hebrew uh, there. So we, we can't know if he's using ex what exactly he's saying. But it seems like he is evoking the uh, the the sons of Aaron eating the bread of the presence. And he, in the same way he, in John 6, says, I am the manna, I am that bread in the temple. He is saying, I am the bread of the presence. I am that bread in the temple. I am the bread you eat. So when you, in the Sermon on the Mount, hunger and thirst after righteousness, you're led into the second room and you are filled with righteousness because you eat the flesh and blood of the Lord, right? Jesus is saying, I am that bread. So, so to me, what feels... Um, I don't want to say most correct. The thing that resonates for me is the idea that he is the feast, right? Which makes him the fruit of the tree. Now, these symbols are complex and they are cosmic and they are multivalent. And can they mean multiple things? You bet. And could a, do I think that a prophet might have a, uh, two prophets could both be prophets of God and might use the tree imagery in different ways? I absolutely uh, think that it could be true. So uh, that by way of saying, I, I don't know there has to be a person here who is right and who is wrong. I think we're dealing with very complex, powerful symbols. Um, and I think you and I have, uh, as far as I can tell, vast areas of agreement um, and shared curiosity with maybe like this interesting questions where we might differ in interpretation. No, I've read your stuff. I, I have I have said to people that that uh, among all of the 
gospel thinkers, let's say out there, or lay scholars and even regular scholars, I think that I align more with you than anybody else. And, and, and what is great about that, and I want people to understand this, yeah, I'm not a scholar, a paid scholar, you're not a trained scholar, you know, nothing exists, but it's very interesting to me as I, as I've gone through what you, what we talked about at lunch and, and read your books, I have come to so many of those same conclusions. There's something to that, you know, and, and it's it's how did I get there not going through scholarship, not being trained or told about these things? But I, I find it through the scriptures. Yeah. Right. And and, and yet I, I read and you see, you, you, you know, I read what, you, what you've said. And, I, and of course, there's others that were similar to that. But it's like that is in many ways, it's kind of a confirmation. Right. Of 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 one's individual study. And I think we all need to do that. Yes. We don't need to rely on somebody else. Of course, we want to listen to the prophets and the brethren and what they have to say and, and their take on the scriptures and, and et cetera. That's, that's key. But, but we need to individually be, get our noses into the scriptures to understand these things. And, and I think in the days that we live today, I, I just you have a tough time if you don't, if, with your testimony, if you are not really rooted in these things. I think that is right. And I think that's the religion of the visionary men, right? It's small D democratic. God is everybody's father. Everybody, God will talk to anybody. God loves everyone. God loves the sinner and the saint. Maybe there are no saints. God loves all of us sinners, right? Uh, uh, the, the way is open and, uh, and, and salvation is free, right? And Jesus is the way to... Uh, to enter into the presence of light and life. Um, and I, I do think we're commanded to study. And I, this is one of my big frustrations is I, I, I don't know why, I don't know why this is so hard, yeah. um, but we're struggling. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, Dave, thanks so much for doing this. We will get you back and, and go over the Sermon on the Mount and who knows what else. But uh, again, I love these discussions, uh, love what you've studied and learned and, and the opportunity for you to share that with us. So thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Greg. Mm-hmm.